I have the great pleasure of introducing two great speakers for, for this afternoon. Uh, before that, real quick, my name is Francisco Noguera. I'm a student here at the School of International and Public Affairs. And I'm working with the conference in, in, in bringing this, weaving this topic into, into the conversation. We're talking about social innovation in a networked world. That's the theme of the conference this year. And we uh, have, uh, we're very lucky to have two, two speakers and two pioneers in this world to, to speak to us about what's the, the, the avant-garde in, 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 in the mobile industry for development. Um, Gautam Iwaturi is going to moderate a conversation with uh, Dr. Nathan Eagle. Gautam is the founder and managing partner of uh, Signal Point Partners, a new investment fund that invests in mobile applications for, for, developing, uh, for developing and emerging markets. Uh, and Nathan Eagle is the founder of um, Jana, which is the new name of uh, Text Eagle, uh, which is uh, listed in the, in the, in the conference schedule. Uh, he's based uh, out of Boston. He's done a lot of research uh, about the role of uh, mobile phones in, in development. And the idea is for this to be a, a really a interactive and engaging conversation about where this space is going and, and what the mobile rev revolution means for, for development. So thank you both for coming. And let me turn it over to Gautam. So uh, welcome everybody to the session. Uh, thank you very much, Francisco and uh, the organizers here for inviting me to, uh, to this um, great conference. Uh, I have the very easy job today of just tossing questions at um, my fellow panelist here, Dr. Nathan Eagle. And uh, I'm very, very um, delighted and very honored to be sitting next to him because I've been hearing about his work for many years. Uh, in all sorts of capacities at MIT and elsewhere. Uh, and now he is, like me, an entrepreneur and a businessman. So I'm sure we'll have interesting things to talk about uh, on that, uh, that side as well. Um, so just to recap, my name is Gautam. I'm at Signal Point Partners, which is really just a uh, sort of a holding company for uh, startups and investments in the mobile space. And we have businesses in Kenya around mobile and financial services, and in India uh, in mobile health. And that's where I'm most active, and um, we may talk a bit about healthcare in the course of this conversation. Uh, Nathan, may I call you Nathan? Please. Okay. <laughs> Would you like to say a bit more before we sort of get into questions about your background and uh, what uh, you're up to now? Yeah, sure. Um, and, and also, I think it'd be great to have, have this truly interactive. Um, so if, you, if people in the audience want to have, you know, ask questions or, or have their voice heard, it feels like that makes a lot more sense than just us kind of chatting. I have a lot of hard, hard <laughs> And so, so, yeah, so I can dodge all go from hard questions by fielding some of yours, maybe. Um, I, so my background, uh, I ended up joining the wearable computing group at MIT back in 2001. Uh, and wearable computing in 2001 meant literally people were strapping computers to their backs and head-mounted displays to their heads, and they would walk around campus um, collecting really interesting data about themselves and their environment, much to the amusement of, of, of everyone else on campus who are watching, around, watching these guys waddle around with computers strapped to their backs. Um, luckily, this coincided with when the first mainstream programmable phone was launched um, in about 2001, 2002. And so I made a deal with my advisor um, that if I could program that phone to capture similar types of data, I wouldn't have to spend the rest of my graduate career dressing up like a computer. And, uh, and he graciously agreed, and kind of the, the rest is history. So I was kind of one of the first you know, mobile phone programmers back in 2001. And that skill set has led to a, a, you know, a pretty exciting, well, in my mind, I've, I've had a really fun time over the last decade, um, ranging from starting uh, companies that help socially awkward singles in Manhattan get better connected with their mobile phones, um, to things that I, I hopefully will be a bit more impactful um, related to uh, uh, mobile phones and development. And, uh, and I think we could talk a little bit maybe about the, about the company that I'm now you know, full-time running. So, so uh, that was a great idea and great suggestion from Nathan. Please do raise your hand. Uh, and as we're having this conversation, I'd be very happy to call on you if it fits nicely into the, into the flow. Um, so maybe we could start a bit about, I think, what is underlying a lot of the work all of the work you've been doing, I guess, for a long time, um, which is this mobile revolution. 
And uh, for a lot of us, you know, mobile revolution really is the amazing fact that people can just pick up a phone and speak to anybody else in the world anytime they want. Uh, and then for some of us, you know, we've been working on things like how do you deliver healthcare and deliver finance and deliver education in different ways now that mobile is around and it can be much more you know, low cost, much more convenient, it can reach remote areas. There's so many things you can do to change the way delivery happens. So I'm, uh, I'm, my impression, however, is that uh, some of how you have thought of this mobile revolution comes from a very different angle, and one that's exciting and, and certainly new to me, which is what do we learn about people uh, because they have mobiles in their pockets? So maybe you could just say a little bit about how you see this mobile rev revolution, what it's meant for your work the last 10 years or so. Yeah, I mean, it's, I, I, I come at it from, I come at mobile phones specifically from, from really two perspectives. There's the perspective of the end user, you know, the consumer, the, the individual, um, and uh, and then there's this pers the perspective kind of globally of perhaps like a network operator. Um, what you're what you're alluding to is like taking the approach of the network operator, and so these network operators, mobile, there's there's you know over 600 in the world right now, GSM providers, um, and to be a mobile operator, you generally have to buy a GSM license, and then you start basically passing out SIM cards and getting people to you know, try to use your network. Um, back. Implicitly in being an operator, what you really are doing is you're being a, a data creator. Um, mobile phone operators, by the nature of their business, are creating extraordinary amounts of, of data uh, about mobile phone subscribers, right? And it goes far beyond who calls who, right? It, it, it goes into things like, um, you know, who is going where, looking at aggregate movement patterns. Um, you look, it goes into, like, who is sending money to whom. Uh, it goes into things like, um, well, I mean, we can, we can there, there's just huge amounts of potential. Um, you know, to the, one of the things that we're doing right now with, uh, with MTN in Rwanda is looking at inferring socioeconomic status um, based on scratch card denomination. So being able to infer, you know, the, if, uh, if two people are spending the same amount of money on their mobile phone, but one person is buying 25 cent scratch cards, and uh, lots of them, and the other person's buying like one scratch card for $10, you can you figure out I mean, who has more disposable income, right? You can, you can start inferring socioeconomic status. But the beauty of this type of data is that it doesn't represent a snapshot of, of a current society. What it does is longitudinal inherently, meaning you can start identifying trends and, um, and if we get into it, we can talk a, bit, a little bit about this work that we're doing in Kibera in Kenya. We're looking at how people are changing their socioeconomic status. Um, again, inferred by their mobile phone usage, um, but based on, on things like uh, economic springboards. So meaning if they move to a particular area uh, in Kenya, um, there is an increased probability that they improve the socioeconomic status. And we can start uncovering these types of kind of fairly implicit um, but quite powerful correlations using using data coming from mobile operators so it, it sounds like you know the the potential is endless when it comes to the sectors the development impact you know whether we're talking about health or as you said um, you know improving people's incomes I personally I would like the audience's indulgence I would like to ask Nathan some technical questions <laughs> okay just kind of to understand how does this thing work all right, so, so we've all got phones in our pockets. And what is it that's happening? We're all sitting in this room. We've all got phones in our pockets. What are we telling, you know, let's say, the cloud or, or the operators up there? Yeah. And then once we tell them that, what have you been able to do? You know, how have you managed to get your hands on our information and then crunch it? And you know, how does that process actually work? OK. I mean, it's, I, I, you know. Sort of take us through a day in your life, I guess. <laughs> um, all right. So. Anytime you receive a text message, or you top up your phone, or make a phone call, um, or basically do anything with that phone, you know, that event, that behavior is represented in a row in a massive database, right? And in that database, you, that row consists of you know, your uh, unique ID essentially on your SIM card. You can think of it as your phone number, um, and perhaps the, re the recipient's phone number if you're making a phone call or something. Um, but then also with things like it's the, the tower, the, the cell tower that's associated with that event. Um, and so, you know, when you start thinking about this in aggregate, what this is, what this represents is this huge database with, you know, literally trillions, trillions of rows um, showing, you know, where someone was at a given time. 
because there's always a timestamp associated with each behavior. And so what your tip, so you know, then what you've got, if you're just looking at things like location, is you can see, you know, person A is, you know, around this particular area, and then goes, you know, at three o'clock, then goes here at four o'clock, and then goes perhaps here at like eight o'clock. Um, and if you're getting that not just over one day, but over the course of many years, um, you can start building mathematical models uh, predicting what this individual is going to do next, right? Because we are creatures of habit. There's this implicit routine. Um, and while it's fun to be able to say, oh, well, we can predict what's going to, what, what uh, the behavior of literally hundreds of millions of idiosyncratic individuals um, with reasonably high accuracy, uh, in my mind, kind of maybe bringing this back to kind of a development focus, um, the, one of the really intriguing things happens is when people uh, vary, vary from that standard routine. Um, so, for example, I, I spent, um, I spent a, a, an extended weekend in the basement of the president of Mexico's home during the H1N1 pandemic. Um, and, uh, you know, talk about a outlier behavior, right? People suddenly in Mexico were very much varying from, from, from their normal behavior. Um, what we were working on is with Telefonica, um, trying to figure out ways that we could identify populations that were getting sick. So this is, this is much less to do with following an individual and figuring out where that, where you specifically are going. Um, where this gets powerful is building models of the aggregate population and looking at behavior trends of the aggregate and how the aggregate may vary or deviate from their standard behavior. Uh, in ways that may be indicative of, uh, you know, the dissemination of an airborne pathogen, for example. Please. So you're, 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 uh, yeah, that, that question goes down, kind of leads us towards Fort Meade. Um, I mean, there's a, there's a lot of organizations who are very good at doing exactly that. Um, I don't take that, you know, that data is not data I use. That data is potentially available to, to uh, you know, a, a wide range of, of uh, three-letter, uh, you know, organizations, but not, uh, that's not something that we deal with. And the, one of the reasons is that um, I need, to, you know, if I'm doing this with my academic hat on, uh, you know, these are not consenting human subjects, right? Like, I can't, I, like, what we need to have is make it so that the data that we touch is not personally identifiable. So I'm, we're not, when I say location, I'm not talking about a GPS location. I'm getting, you know, we get rough idea within maybe a square kilometer of where this kind of hash ID is. We don't have any phone numbers. We have none of that. Um, once you start talking about digging into the, the, the actual content of SMSs, um, that's a lot harder to anonymize. And... Um, you know, and whilst you know some people have gone down that path, I, you know I'm I'm inundated with data already. I don't need additional data streams. So this, the shorter answer is no. I'm not touching that data. Um, but it actually leads into the second question that you asked about how do I have access to this data in the first place? Um, and uh, you know I've been lucky enough to be known within the mobile operator world as uh, an individual who best basically will. Um, uh, give you a bit of insight into the underlying dynamics of your subscriber base as an operator uh, for free. So mobile phone operators come to me and say, look, we've got a, you know, three petabytes of data. You know, we have neither the human resources nor the computational horsepower to do anything with this data. We've heard that you're the guy that can, can help us out and figure out what's, what, what actually is going on, Try maybe whether it's modeling churn or trying to predict what kind of you know, new product might be uh, appropriate in which markets. Um, and I do that for free. Uh, in exchange, I, I get to use uh, anonymized version of that data for social good. You know, whether that social good is to um, you know, try to build models of influenza um, or, uh, or trying to um, you know, work with urban planners in, in capital cities like Kigali to try to figure out where you put in the next road. Um, you know, how do you optimize traffic? Because again, the CDR, if you think about it, what we've got is you know, every traffic jam that has ever happened in any of these countries, it's recorded in this, in, in this, in this big database. 
right? Because we can start measuring aggregate traffic flows and we can start seeing when traffic is slowing down, not by looking at individual behavior, but by looking at that aggregate. And so when you start you know, adding this type of novel data uh, to, um, you know, to, especially in places like Kigali where they have very limited resources for urban planning, you can add, you can add extraordinary value. Um, and so, that's, uh, so that's, that's, what I, that's what I get out of it in exchange for helping these mobile operators. What to you are the most, uh, you know, it sounds, and I've read some of your work and uh, you know, look at the stuff you've been involved with. It's everything from, as you said, urban planning to socioeconomic development for specific groups to public health um, and your company, which in fact is income generating for, for low income people in some cases, and we'll, we'll get to your company, what it does. But in your mind, this, first of all, what is this field called? Does this field have a name? Have you named it? Is it? <laughs> um, I, I try to not be associated. I like I, I get pigeonholed and, and rightfully so, perhaps, as the mobile phone guy, um, and uh, and you know that's that's fine. But in my mind, this is far more than a particular technology. Um, this is the, the you know this is the advent of this era of big data, and big data is a term that I think a lot of people have probably heard. I mean, it's something that's being thrown around a lot. But it goes beyond just CDR, call data records. I mean, literally, we're leaving digital traces of our behavior, um, you know, by doing anything. Whether you know me swiping my credit card in that taxi to get here, um, to uh, to you know checking in on Foursquare or whatever. But but also, you know, there's digital traces that um, that are being generated in emerging markets that that go far beyond just the mobile phone. And and it's this is going to go nothing but exponentially up. I mean, in terms of the amount of data that we leave in the wake of our day-to-day -day behavior. Um, and so that's, and that's, that's kind of the space that I like to play in. So mobile big data is? Big data. Big data period. Big data period. <laughs> All right. Did you have a question? Yeah. Yeah, it was on an actual subject. Um, Nathan, where do you see Seldar going, and how do you see it being used? Uh, can you so, so exp tell people what Seldar is? Yeah, so Seldar is the electronic trace as far as your phone uh, with the tower, and then being able to use tracking tracking that individual person from tower to tower to tower and seeing what their patterns are and using them as far as whatever purposes that you want to. It's a technology that the operators provide. Uh, I guess, I, I mean, I, I'm not familiar with it. I thought I, I heard of it before, but this is clearly not something I know about then. I mean, it's so... It, so the three-letter agencies are... are, 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 are yeah, I, I mean, there's... there. Okay, I mean, so there, there's, you know, it sounds like it's a variant of what's called simply pinging. Right, you can ping a phone, uh, and you can get essentially what tower it's at. And if you repeatedly ping a phone, you can just basically get the tower transitions as that phone moves, and you can do that in real time. Um, what do I think about that? I, I mean, that for one thing, that's that's not something that I'm interested in because it doesn't scale. You no, know, when you do pings, you're taking up network resources, and when you want to ping 100 million people, your network falls down. Um, and so, really, I'm interested in the behavior of the aggregate. I want all 100 million. Um, and so, so that that's, that type of technology, the pinging type of technology, doesn't doesn't work for me anyway. And I also like um, not focusing on individuals because I think I find that scary, uh, and I think you should find that scary too. Um, so it's it's again something that I, I tend to not touch. That's, that's absolutely true. That's, that's the beauty of CDR, right? It's a single unified language. Um, you know, so we, we, do, we don't, we, as, as I said earlier, we don't touch SMS. We don't touch content. No. So, so CD, but what's nice is that there's only five major manufacturers of back-end billing systems for mobile operators. So there's five, essentially, languages that you have to learn how to read uh, in order to basically engage with every operator on the planet. Uh, and you know the languages are a little bit different, but it more or less comes down to the same thing. Where it's, there's a unique ID, there's a tower ID, there's a timestamp, that sort of thing, and that's true across all countries. So let's talk about this point because this, as I understand, is to some extent the foundation of Jana, is the ability that you have built within the company to talk to all these operators, their billing systems, and um, use those billing systems to compensate people in 
what, 80, 90 different countries? 95 now. 95 countries. Yeah. And what do you compensate them for, and what's the sort of overall objective of the business? Sure. Okay. So um, maybe it, it makes sense to talk a little bit about the backstory before I launch into a, a, you know, a pitch about you know, why we're going to change the world. Um, so I left, uh, I, I, I ended up uh, being lucky enough to being hired onto the faculty at MIT, um, but I wanted to do something that ultimately would be bigger than you know, mobile social dating, right? And, and I wasn't seeing the impact, uh, this was back in 2006, I wasn't seeing the impact in this country uh, or in South Korea or Finland for that matter, but in 2006 things were really kicking off in, in, uh, in, in Africa. Uh, um, and Kenya at that time had, was the fastest growing mobile phone market in the world. And so uh, I was lucky enough to convince the powers that be to, instead of having my office in Cambridge, I would be living out in this rural village and uh, basically seeing firsthand uh, how, you know, what this revolution really looked like. Um, and uh, that turned out to be really naive. Uh, so, you know, I'm sitting in this random hut in rural Kenya with my laptop trying to think about the next app that will have an impact on this community. Like, I, I'm, I'm no, still not qualified to be doing that. So I ended up starting to teach at the University of Nairobi, uh, teaching computer science students how to program their own phones uh, and build their own apps for their own communities, um, which made a lot more sense than some stranded MIT professor trying to build those apps for them, right? So um, out of that, those types of collaborations, we started working on projects um, with organizations in Kenya like the Ministry of Health. Um, and uh, one such project, was uh, the, the Ministry of Health in Kenya wanted to know what the blood supply levels were in these remote hospitals across the country. Um, because there's all sorts of, there's a, there's a lot of problems associated with the way it was currently being done. There's basically a guy in a pickup truck would you know, do these tours of the different hospitals, write down what the blood supply levels were, and then the next two week tour he'd bring back the blood again. And so it creates a high latency um, environment, meaning there's, there's a lot of time that goes by between when a measurement is made and when ultimately blood can be delivered. And so um, someone in the ministry had a bright idea about let's, let's use text messages to do this. And so, um, so I, was, uh, I was kind of the guy that was recruited to build this SMS-based system, a system that allowed the rural nurses in Kenya to text in what their current blood supply levels were. And I had a, a student build a, just a beautiful visualization uh, tool so let people, let these guys at the centralized blood banks log in and see kind of in virtually real time what the blood supply levels were across all these remote hospitals. Um, and I, I was quite proud of this solution. I thought this was a quite a clever pro uh, solution to this, this problem associated with latency. Um, but in reality, it was a total failure. That platform that we built didn't work. And it didn't work not because of any technical shortcoming, but it, it didn't work because of a fundamental lack of insight on my part uh, associated with doing work in these types of environments. And that lack of insight had to do with the fact that I didn't understand what the price of a text message really represented. You know, what we were asking these rural nurses to do is every day send a text message with, the, with that current blood, uh, the current blood uh, levels in their, in their hospital. Um, and way we had, you know, for the first week we had virtually all the nurses text in this data. Uh, then the second week, about half stopped texting in it, and then by the end of the month, we had one or two nurses still giving us data, and the rest had completely dropped out. And it turns out that the price of a text message represents a fairly substantial fraction of a rural nurse's day's wage, right? And so that was the thing that I didn't get. Um, but luckily, kind of, you know, we've framed this backstory, so I don't have to explain um, the fact that I, I uh, am quite intimate with mobile phone operators. I had, I had access to Safaricom's back-end billing system because I was doing this other work. And so I built a little airtime reward platform, a little platform that basically for every properly formatted text message we would receive from that a rural nurse, um, we would send that rural nurse about 10 cents worth of airtime. You know, enough to compensate that nurse for the cost of the, uh, the text message and about a penny extra to say thank you. And for the opportunity to earn one cent of airtime, virtually every rural nurse re-engaged with the platform. And ultimately now it's being, it's being deployed nationwide. But um, the bigger insight from my perspective and the reason why I ended up leaving academia is that insight of we can use airtime as a, as a mechanism to motivate behavior and motivate data collection. So instead of getting data from mobile operators, getting it from kind of the top down, another source of viable data is from the bottom up, you know, incentivizing people to, to provide 
us with data. And that suddenly means the state space, in terms of the type of the data that we can gather, goes up significantly. We're no longer constrained to you know, what cell tower you're at, or you know, what, whether you've made an SM, take, you know, typed in an SMS or whatever. Uh, we can ask whatever we want to ask. And so that, that airtime reward platform that I originally built uh, for Safaricom, it's now been integrated into the back-end billing systems of 235 mobile operators you know, across 95 countries. And what that means is that gives us the ability, um, you know, the unprecedented ability to, um, to be able to communicate and compensate all of their prepaid subscribers. And when you sum up the total of prepaid subscribers, that is across these 95 countries, we're talking about over 2.1 billion people. Um, so we have the ability to go out and, and compensate 2.1 billion people and with, with virtually no latency. You know, again, from my laptop, you know, I can type in that phone number, I can type in the denomination I want to send that person, I push enter, and within 10, sec 10 seconds, that denomination is transferred to that person's phone. So it's, it's a phenomenally powerful platform to solicit data and to get, p drive people to action. So that's, that's the backstory. Who pays? Who pays? Oh no, I, I mean, I buy bulk airtime from operators. I, I literally show up with bags of cash um, and say, look, I want to buy a bunch of airtime from you. Let's, let's integrate this thing into your back end billing system and I've got more cash in the car and we'll just keep going, right? I mean, so, so operators love me, right? I, like what, what I represent is a fundamentally new revenue stream for the mobile operator. Instead of trying to continue to get more and more money out of that guy's pocket who's making $3 a day, Right? Like there's a real upper bound to how much an individual in these emerging markets is will, are willing to pay for telecommunication <laughs> services. No matter how great and how targeted those services are, like you're not going to get $2 out of that guy's pocket if, if he's making $3 a day, right? But you know, you know who has two bucks? Like P&G, Unilever, Diageo, Coca-Cola. Uh, they're massive global brands who are desperate to engage with kind of their next billion customers, right? And, and so at the end of the day, the money's coming from their pocket. That's a very different question than what we do. Like we don't, I, for, you know, when I approach a mobile operator, the last thing I say is social good. Like that's that's not the way in the door. What I say is ARPU, average revenue per user. We can we can increase your ARPU. Um, you know, the social the social good uh, aspects, uh, regrettably, are don't move the needle. That's a good question. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so it, it really depends on the type of data that we're, that we're trying to glean, right? So if we're asking a rural Bolivian woman what she thinks about uh, laundry detergent, what brand she picks, um, it's quite hard to discern what, whether she's giving us the correct answer or she's just really quickly going through a survey. You know, you can look at things like timestamps and figure out how fast people are giving you data. Um, and we do that. And so we build, you know, each of our members have kind of a reputation associated with them about you know, our estimate of whether or not they're a reliable survey taker based on how much time and also the types of information they get us. If they're, flat, if they're straight lining, right, meaning if they're giving us basically the same question, you know, we, can build, we can very quickly establish that that's probably someone who we shouldn't give another survey to. Um, the easier uh, types of data to, to validate uh, are, the object, are the, sorry, the objective data. So we're working with the World Bank right now. So the World Bank uh, spends $77 million every four years to do uh, purchasing power par parity studies. And so what P when, you, when, you, when you read about prices around the world, sometimes you have that PPP next to the price, right? So that PPP comes from like, how much does a dollar buy you, you know, in Brazil versus Bangalore, right? And so the way you can establish what these relative pow purchasing power um, criteria metrics are, are is to basically go out and you have a basket of, say, I know, 500 goods, 500 commodities, like a kilo of rice. You know, how much does a kilo of rice cost in Bolivia or in India or in rural Kenya? Uh, 
and, uh, and then you can create these, these metrics. And so what they do is they send out literally thousands of professional price collectors to like 140 countries. Um, and, and they do this price gathering. Um, and that's why it costs $77 million. Uh, what we're doing is we're now doing that uh, for the bank. Um, but we're not, you know, we're not, uh, we're no longer basically constraining people uh, or constraining it to pre professionals. We're letting anyone participate. But then we have to validate, you know, the accuracy of this data. And the way we do it is building mathematical models again, uh, and through essentially redundancy, right? You ask, you get the the same. Um, product in a particular store, for example, and you have you know, several people go, several independent people all go to and, and see what the price of a two liter bottle of Coca-Cola is in that particular market. If they all give you the same answer, then you can build up a, a confidence that you know, that is indeed the correct answer. Not only that, but you can start associating that confidence with the individual person who, who gave it to you. So if someone gave you uh, 20 answers correctly in a row, where, where it's been all validated, that 21st one, maybe you don't need to send four other people to gather that price data. Maybe you only need to send one other person. So we're starting to build up these kind of confidence metrics around these individuals. Um, but at, at the end of the day, it all comes back to data and math. Yeah, in the back. Uh, Curtis Wesley, uh, professor at uh, Indiana University. Um, what other industries are you going to be going into? I can see some type of currency arrangement or similar to PayPal or banking and offshoots of that. And there are tons of industries you could use currency type trading for. What other directions are you going to go into? I'm, I'm pretty excited about um, the amount of money that's being spent on advertising in the developing world. Right, and that's and and, and you know I, I, I love the the finance angle. Um, I mean, there's there's it's not a secret that we, we um, were initially given a, a lot of money from uh, from a large bank um, because again they think of this as as currency. But um, at the end of the day, right now where the dollars are, um, it's in advertising, and especially the ineffic the inefficiencies in the dollars in my mind. Right, so you know there's well over two hundred billion dollars that get spent. On advertising in these markets, um, and uh, and it's spent. I, I think at least it's spent extraordinarily inefficiently, right? If you want again, going back to that rural woman in Bolivia, if you want to try to um, advertise your laundry detergent to her, you know the, what you have to do is you're basically putting money in the pockets of people who own billboards, right? Or in the pockets of people who own radio stations or television stations or maybe newspapers. Um, you know, it's not because these massive global brands don't understand the benefit of targeted marketing. It's because there is no way to target. There is no way to do anything more efficient. And so, you know, in my mind, the, the thing that we're really going after is that $200 billion spent. You know, and if we can redirect some of that spend out of the pockets of the guys who own billboards and into the pockets of the consumers that these global brands are trying to reach, we can do something that's fundamentally profound. Right? We can, we can suddenly um, economically empower an, an extraordinarily large number of people. So, yeah. So you, you said it's about data and math, right? And it sounds like the combination of the data you have, the access to data, the math, and what you build, you know, from what we've discussed here, can do you know, virtually anything. There's so many applications, so much we can learn, uh, and so much impact we can have. And then you're talking about Diageo, P&G, Unilever, and you know, is that selling out? Is it selling out to <laughs> oh, maybe. all of us? But at, 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 types of but stuff? you know, I I I, I don't preface like I, you know I was invited here to be on a, a social venture pa panel, right? But I, I don't when I, I talk to reporters, I don't talk about this as a social venture, right? Like you know what we are going to be is a billion dollar company, and um, you know ultimately we are responsible. I, I want to grow this thing as fast as possible. I think there's a massive opportunity here, and. You know, the beauty about our model is that we, by becoming a billion dollar company, we are going to empower a huge number of people. Um, and so I, I spent a lot of time um, trying to think about what kind of business models where I can basically try to maximize shareholder value and also maximize my social impact. Um, and I, you know, I, this, is, this is the one that we kind of stumbled upon because. Um, you know, this is a model where if we are really successful with the PNGs of the world, we can provide a billion people with a five percent raise, 
So if you take the 30% of the spend that's being misspent on advertising in the developing world uh, and take it out of the pockets of the people who own radio stations and into the pockets of the consumers that the brands are trying to reach, um, that offsets, that can offset the, uh, the airtime expenditure of, for about 50%. So you, it cuts in, in half how much these consumers spend in airtime. And on average, these consumers are spending anywhere between 6 to 12% of their day's wage on scratch cards. So what this means, scratch, scratch cards are airtime top up. And so if we can redirect 30%-ish of the, that current spend, we can provide a billion people with a 5% raise. Um, and that money has to come from somewhere. And boy, I really don't want to be taking it from you know, the Gates Foundation. Like that's, that only gets you so far, right? You're not going to be able to give a billion people a 5% raise by you know, asking for handouts. Like to really make an impact, you've got to play ball. And so, and, and you go where the money is, and the money is with Unilever. Okay, so putting, let's say, an investor hat on. Uh, you know, it's compelling to say that there, you know, obviously you've got access to hundreds of millions of people, billions, two billion people, I guess. Uh, how many of those people would you see as receptive to, you know, the kinds of stuff that you are able to, you know, help advertise for, or the kinds of questions and work you're able to extend through the platform. Well, so, what, so what the, the, uh, the interest on the consumer side, um, in, in fact, actually, that's the one universal thing that we found across cultures and across continents is that, you know, as a species, if there's one thing that we all really like, it's free stuff, uh, and specifically free airtime, right? Like, you know, so. Um, yeah, everyone's receptive to that message. Everyone is spending money on their mobile phone. Everyone would like to spend less on their mobile phone. Like that is a universal. Um, and so like that's never been the problem. I think the, the real problem has been how do you convince the, uh, the PNGs of the world that they really should start engaging? Uh, it's, it's time, like you know, Bolivia's about to switch on, right? Or Niger rural Nigeria is really where their, be their, their best potential for high growth in, in, in 2012. Um, so the, that's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's making that argument uh, rather than the argument to the consumer that you're really, you, you know, you should want free stuff. Yes. Have you used the technology yet to do any kind of medical services advertising, like for example, like imagine World Health Organization using this type of technology to get the word out about immunization in the day or something like that? We, we try not to. Um, I mean, and, and, and the reason is, again, um, you know, so, so our, uh, in terms of the, the types of deals that we, we, we've been approached in the last six months, I think we were counting it up, it's, we've got, you know, over, over 300 unsolicited requests for proposals. 90% um, are for NGOs, from NGOs, um, and, and they're relatively small dollar figures. Um, and we're a small company, we simply can't, we can't keep up with that kind of demand. Um, um, so that's, that's one reason. Um, and secondly, I mean, we need to kind of go where the money is. So if, if the, the World Health Organization ultimately is, you know, paying the same price as, as P&G would be, um, then, and, and has the volume, has the scale to that, uh, of a comparable, you know, sort of comparable size, then, then we'd certainly be interested. But traditionally, those types of, you know, typically pilots um, don't result in, in more than $100,000 worth of revenue. And again, that just doesn't move the needle for us. Um, it, it may at some point, and I think at some point, I'd really like to build something that is more self-serve, meaning so you log onto the website, you, 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 you basically talk about what demographic you want to target, the message that you want, the amount of airtime incentive let you deal with the whole thing and you can just have an API access to our back end. Um, we're not there yet. But, uh, but yeah, I, I hope to be able to cater to those types of things in the future. It would be like Yahoo's e-commerce store, right? So build your own e-commerce website through Yahoo. It would be similar. You know, create your own online campaign. Or, or survey or, or whatever, yeah. yeah.
$35 public PC was announced mm -hmm. in India. So, so it will <coughs> it enable us for the EOPT, the not only SMS, but also the internet. So how do you see this trend and uh, what it will uh, affect your business model and the industry? Oh, I, I love it. I mean, like that trend does nothing but extraordinarily help us. And, and, and the reason is, is simply that SMS sucks as a protocol. In fact, we, we, um, we, we try not to do anything with SMS anymore. We have kind of a, 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 our own proprietary protocol that sits, uh, that's, that's kind of tunnels into what's called USSD, um, which we call UCMP, which is, our, which is like the protocol on top of that. In, in any case, um, you know, as people, as more and more people migrate to even some variant of the mobile web, whether it's just even a simple text-based web browser, suddenly, um, you know, we can do a lot more. Um, and, and you're becoming less and less uh, at the mercy of the operators in terms of how much, you know, in terms of the communication costs. So um, it's a model I love, but at the same time, like, I, you know, I was, uh, uh, I was giving a talk at this, uh, at this mobile conference last week, um, and everyone wanted to talk about LTE and you know, the next iPhone. Um, and it's really easy to get caught up, right? It's really easy to get caught up in this kind of, wow, these, these next smartphones are gonna be awesome and, and amazing. But um, until they get to the price points that, that you're alluding to, uh, it's kind of irrelevant for the majority of the world. Um, so the thing that really excites me in, that, in, in the space that you're talking about is, is, not, is, is not these next generation um, you know, higher technology type devices, but um, you know, what's happening right now in Kenya with these <coughs> gray market Android phones, you know, selling for price points under 80 bucks. You know, they only have an hour and a half of talk time, right? And they, they have batteries inside of tumors and they, they're, you know, like, but you know, so that we've got a long ways to go, but that's what's exciting, right? I mean, it's, it's being able to start looking at, you know, as this price point goes down, whether it's for mobile web or smartphones and apps, um, suddenly, um, like, I think they really will have a, a, a potential to make much more of an impact than how, how the impact they've already made today. Um, yeah. Yeah, in the back. In terms of, uh, I guess, the increase of gray market Android phones and the rise of mobile data uh, in these areas, um, is, can the networks, I guess, handle uh, the amount of data that would come with mobile web? The, the answer is it always depends, right? So in India, it could, they couldn't. Uh, mobile web really got, uh, you know, so India bought in to these, these kind of 2G uh, networks, I guess, originally. Um, and, they, and it was, or at least, you know, it's anecdotally described as one of the reasons why um, mobile, mobile web hadn't really taken off as much as in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, where you're not burdened by incumbent technology, right? Where you can essentially leapfrog what the West has and put in the latest, whether it's LTE or 3G or whatever. Um, uh, the, it, it, what's interesting is that the price point, I mean, similar to how we buy laptops today, you can think of that the price points for the way operators buy hardware is very similar. It's generally the kind of the same uh, price um, for that base station, regardless of whether it's, you know, the first, you know, whether you're buying it in 1998 or today. Uh, it's just the, the technology changes. So it comes down to whoever bought the, the thing most recently um, has a network that it has the highest bandwidth. Um, and so that's cool, right? Because suddenly it means that the, these countries that you know, are just now building out their infrastructure, um, they, they get the best stuff. Yeah, question in the front. Okay. Um, so I just want to get my arm trying the business model. All right. Um, you, you talked about um, the, the case with the, with, the blood, with the blood surveys. Yep. And then you said that um, big sponsors will um, will give you, you know, oodles of, of cash to um, to buy this airtime in bulk from the from the mobile network operators. But what what I what I fail to see is what what do the what do the sponsors get from that? What do our clients get? Yeah. So the, so the two services. Yeah. Yeah. Because you talk about billboards. So I'm not yeah. Sure I never I never actually really that. explained our business model. So that's <laughs> probably why you have a question about it. Um, so we do, we offer one of two things, right? And it's very, it's, it's, I like to think of it as relatively simple. If we start getting into the weeds, it, it, you'll see it's much more complex. But um, we offer, we sell one of two things. We sell data. So if, uh, you know, for, take, take the P&G example. If P&G wants to figure out what kind of laundry detergent um, a rural Bolivian woman uses right now, they do, and they do, they believe me, they do. 
Um, they spend huge amounts of money flying people out, you know, renting Land Rovers, driving out into the field, and doing face-to-face -face interviews. Literally, there are billions of dollars being spent um, in these markets doing market research. Um, and and, and that, that spend is extraordinarily inefficient, right? You know, because it's going to Land Rovers rather than to actual people who are, who are telling, you know, telling their opinions about products and services. So that's one thing we offer. You know, cut, out, cut the Land Rovers out of your budget. Go out and directly talk to the consumers that, that you want to know about and get their feedback about your products and about your category. So, so when the consumers are buying things with their mobile phones, are you able to start? It has nothing to do with buying things with mobile phones. Like, so, you know, we don't touch any of that. It's on the research side, all we do is, you know, you, you care about rural women in Bolivia and what they think about laundry detergent, we will give you that data, right? We will, we will, we will, we will survey 5,000 rural Bolivian women and tell you what, the, what is top of mind when they think about laundry detergent. And there's no other company that can really do that uh, other than the companies that are in country who are renting Land Rovers and doing this out in face-to-face -face interviews. The, the last the missing piece then is how do you survey those, those 5,000 women efficiently? So they're in our database. I mean, and that's, that is the, so the core asset of our company uh, is this data. So it's a contact information. So we've got, we've got everything from, I mean, so when we engage with someone uh, and they register for our, um, basically getting these targeted often messages, whether this or offers. You know, the offer could be fill out a survey, the offer could be, you know, buy Tide for 50% off. Um, when they register, they tell us all the demographics. They tell us all their consumption patterns. So that, and and um, in exchange, sometimes they get a small, a, a nominal amount of airtime just for registering. I see. And, and is that delivered through their, is the survey done through their mobile phone? It's, or? we try to be communication uh, channel agnostic. I mean, so sometimes if they have access to cyber cafes, they can go use a desktop client. Um, if they have to use, if they don't have uh, that, they can use their, their web browser. If they don't have that, they can use a WAP browser. If they don't have that, we use UCMP, which is kind of a text-based protocol. Um, so, we, like, you know, it does, like, we try to, try to make it uh, so that it doesn't really matter how you communicate with us, but you need to give us the data. So, and, so I guess the next phase in the evolution of this would be disintermediating the billboards, and as people move to smart platforms or more robust platforms, to then deliver that information like AdSense and Google through the platform itself, right? So that phone itself. That's, yeah. yeah. Okay. okay. We have about five minutes, so let's just take one or two more questions and then, uh, yeah. So you, you said that there was two models. One, you sell the data. Yep. Uh, You're right, I didn't finish with the, uh, the second so model. I want to finish that, then I have a question after that. All right. All right, you want me to finish that? Okay, so, 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 so the other, the other uh, waiting for the question. Uh, the, other, the other thing that we do, so we, we, we sell research, and, and ultimately then we also sell marketing. And, and the marketing, it's, it's, not, it's not like in the traditional ad network sense where we're trying to sell eyeballs. Um, what we're doing is we're selling action. Um, and so what we offer our clients are things like uh, coupons, uh, group buying, uh, multi-brand commercial initiatives, so bundling products together and then getting incentives. And, and to explain what the, the, to really fully understand, I think, the value proposition, I, the, the first is to better probably explain what these markets are like uh, in terms of airtime as currency. So when, we, when I send that um, rural Kenyan woman um, some airtime, I don't send her five free minutes. I don't send her 15 text messages. I send her 10 Kenyan shillings, right? Uh, 10 Kenyan shillings are then credited to her phone. Um, and the, the, the thing that you have to emphasize is that, you know, for the people in these markets, they've, you know, she values 10 Kenyan, sh Kenyan shillings uh, on her phone exactly equivalently to 10 Ken Kenyan shillings in cash, right? So, so if you follow me there, then um, what we can do is give her 10 Kenyan shillings off that next box of Tide laundry detergent. And instead of having to deal with all these fractured rural merchants and getting that 10 Kenyan shillings out of that rural merchant's till, I mean, which is a tough sell, right? It's instead of that, um, you know, it just goes directly onto the phone. So it's, it's, it's basically mobile couponing in the cloud. Um, and what's, I mean, what some of our clients are very excited about is the idea of group buying in a similar way. If she can convince five of her friends to go out and buy Tide, they all get it for half off. 
right. So, so that's that's the that's that's the that's the marketing model, and that marketing model. You know, I, I talked about the two billion dollars or so that gets spent on research in emerging markets. The uh, the addressable market on that marketing is is two orders of magnitude. Here. Sorry. So, um, well, well, as as uh, as mobile web become gets more and more penetration, eventually it's the protocol, I guess, is HTML. Um, but uh, until until that happens, we're using a variant of USSD, which is uh, which um, which we you know we we've basically built something on top of that USSD protocol that uh, allows us to do things like push registration surveys. And so, if you look at the market. Three or four SIM cards. Yeah, three or four SIM cards. So they'll have three, some of them will have three or four phones because they don't want to have to switch out the okay. SIM cards. So, how do you see that barrier playing out in the future? And what do you see as the solution? So how does that I don't see that as a barrier. I, I mean, the, 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 interesting, the, the important thing is never to associate an individual with a phone number, right? I mean, because that's, because sometimes they, an individual could have multiple phone numbers, sometimes it's a phone shared amongst the family. But it, you know, if it's if an individual can have multiple phone numbers, in fact, actually a large fraction of our members do. They're incentivized to tell us all the numbers that they have, because what we're doing is we're giving them ten Kenyan shillings, and then they can pick which SIM card they want to top up, right? So so they that so that's their incentive for telling us the, the different phone numbers that they'd be using. Yeah. 